Our men, his story. Our transformation, his glory. This is Disciple. Welcome to the Brotherhood. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Disciple Podcast. I'm your host, Matthew Dibler. At Disciple, we're equipping men of God to walk boldly in the light and truth of God's Word so that they can lead lives of ministry and mission and honor the call of the Great Commission. Welcome back to the Disciple Podcast, everyone. I am very excited for a great story tonight, pun intended. We've got (laughs) my brother John Story with us. John, say hello to the Disciple Podcast family, brother. Hello, everyone, and God bless you. I'm really excited. This is, I'm excited, John, because I know little pieces of your story, um, but I have never heard the whole thing from the beginning. So I can't wait to just sit here and unpack this all with you. It's going to be really fun for me, too. Uh, I think we've found that we've got a lot of common connection, don't we, John? Like we, we've got the Tar Heel thing in our blood, don't we? Absolutely. Bleed <laughs> Tar Heel blue, brother. I, I had to uh, I had to wear the Carolina blue hoodie for this recording tonight just to make John feel comfortable. I was you know? I was going to man, but I I already wore my Carolina. Sh- I've been wearing all my Carolina stuff because we beat Duke. So. Oh, I know, <laughs> I know. Been enjoying that, right? You can savor that. For there've been a couple of tough losses since then, but you know what? As long as you get Duke, no that's all that matters. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. brother, it's uh it's a blessing to have you here. I was I was kind of thinking about like how would I introduce John? And you know, I wanted to tell you, this is something that I think of all the time when I'm when I'm in church and you know the Holy Spirit is moving and I mm-hmm. get that urge to just shout out, I think of John stories. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh <laughs> man, I love it. So John can deliver the best hallelujah and some of the best prayer. Uh, I mean, this guy powerful like when we close with a prayer at the end of our discipled uh fellowship meetings on fridays when you let this in john's hands let me tell you he brings it home um so i'm just he he brings such an energy such a passion for the lord and i can't wait to hear his story from the beginning so john let's do that let's let's okay. kind of go back to the beginning because you've got a pretty solid foundation in the faith as a kid, right? Because you you were the son of a pastor, right? Yeah. So um, I was born in uh, Ronald Rapids, North Carolina. All right. And uh, I was born to a Southern Baptist preacher man. Nice. And uh, so right about three years after I was born, we left uh, and went to, my dad went to Southern, uh, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. Okay. And so really most of my like early memories were around the seminary. And uh, we were living in, <laughs> when we first moved to, there, we were living in a place called the Gospel Ghetto. Oh. And it was literally- Sounds inviting. <laughs> yeah. It was a project that the seminary had bought from the city of okay. Louisville. Yeah. And that was where they housed their students who were married with children. Ah, yes. Yeah. Because they were like, oh, go ahead, tear it up. We don't care, you know. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so uh, that was where um, I, I got my first big wheel. I was like three or four years old. Yeah. And me and one, one of the other boys would ride up and down the sidewalks all the time. And that was the first time I was called, uh, we were called Sons of Thunder. Sons of uh, Thunder. We, we thunder I, up and down the sidewalks there. Oh, the wow. Village. So this is where that came from. Because I heard you yeah. and Michael mentioning this after your, you know, get together in, down there in Florida. So the Sons of Thunder was actually born in Louisville, Kentucky on a big wheel, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love it. Like it goes back to when I was, you know, three, four years old. Oh, and when man. he brought it, I hadn't said a word about it, but I have like, uh, I don't know if you've seen like this Chosen, they have this hats. Yeah. My parents bought me the Sons of Thunder hat. Oh, man. I've got the Sons of Thunder t-shirt and all that stuff. So that's, they've always called me that. That's cool. Um, yeah. Cool. So uh, when he brought it up, I hadn't brought it up. And he's like, he was. we were sitting there, and we had been talking for like five or six hours at this point. He's yeah. Like, he was like, man, we're just, we're just Sons of Thunder. I was like, I jumped up. 
I did so a, he I brought did a it up first. shuffle across his living room floor. <laughs> he brought it up. So that's incredible. Yeah, I did, I didn't bring it up. He brought it up. And as soon as he said it, I was like, that's it. We oh, got wow. it. So, so he, you guys who may have heard Michael Stover's testimony on our podcast, he and John are about, how far apart are you in, in Florida? About an hour, hour and a half. An hour, an hour and a half. So they got together here uh, a couple weeks ago, their families, mm-hmm. and uh, spent some great time in fellowship with one another. And yeah, they had this conversation about the Sons of Thunder down there in Florida. And uh, that's, wow, that's a Holy Spirit move big time right there, yeah. you know? So, yeah, it was it was awesome. I love that. But uh, so anyway, we... Uh, uh, not long, it was about six months before we moved there. My sister was born with Down syndrome mm-hmm. and it was really a crushing blow for my parents, uh, you know, because they had given up everything. Um, they, uh, my dad got saved at 19 and went immediately, uh, to college. He gave up, he had a really good job with the power company mm-hmm. and he gave up his job. He went to college at a, a Baptist college um literally like gave up everything for it um and his wife actually when he got home from school one day i left him a note saying i didn't sign up to be a preacher's wife so he got married in high school like at 17 years old Mm -hmm. and they had had one son and she took their son back home to run rapids and left him oh wow because she didn't sign up to be a minister's wife wow and so then he spent like two years there just living like a monk, you know, after being married, you know, it's diff- difficult life. He Absolutely. Lived. And uh, then he met my mom and uh, my mom was there at the same Baptist college and she had come out of a very difficult upbringing mm-hmm. and a uh, very dark upbringing. And she, she, she was determined to get out of it no matter what. Yeah. I was going to say, how does she wind up at the Baptist college with that kind of, she got a scholarship mm-hmm. and she, even though she, her mom never got her up for school, her mom never fixed her breakfast. Her mom never cared. Yeah. What was going on. Right. You know, she didn't care. She said, yeah, it's up to you. Yeah. She had perfect attendance from ninth through 12th grade. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like she was she, determined. She was determined she, to get out of, get Granite, out of that situation. Yeah. Graniteville, South Carolina is kind of a, is a pretty dark area. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's just a lot of poverty and a lot of, uh, a lot of darkness there. And then, yep. you know, I'll get into that later if, if we go there, but, um, uh, I actually got to live a couple of, you know, I actually got to live about 20 minutes from there later on in life. And I got to see just how, um, hopeless that area is. Mm-hmm. And, um, to think it gave me a new respect for my mom. Yeah. Like, and what she endured. And out of there because yeah. she knew she was better than that. And uh, so anyway, they they met in college. They had actually known each other for a little over a year. Um, and then, like, they really busted their, you know, Baptist college. They busted down on him because he had been through a divorce. Mm-hmm. But they didn't take into account that it was because – he chose yeah. to be a minister. Of his decision to go to ministry, yeah. Yeah, and he tried to reconcile that counseling and everything didn't. She she left. She did not get saved. She did not want to be involved. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's tough, really tough. But uh, anyway, met my mom. They dated for a short time. Um, they were, like, quoting psalms together, mm-hmm. you know, on their dates. And, like, they wouldn't even, like, kiss. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then they got, they got married and, um, yeah. And then actually they were in ministry for seven years before they even had me. Oh, wow. And so they had done like Christian schools, uh, teaching, uh, principal dad started his own church, built it up like 80 people. Um, and then he felt the call to go to seminary and my sister was born right in that and they were planning on having four kids, but you know, they saw they were going to need to focus a lot on my sister. Sure. Yeah. And it was really cool that they brought me in on it, you know, cause there's a lot of worry about the jealousy and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so they, they really had like a real conversation with me, you know, at three, three or four years old. And we're mm-hmm. like, 
look, your sister is going to need a lot more of our attention than you do. Sure. And, yeah. Now you can either sit over in the corner and pout about it, or you can be a part of it and you can help us. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, I'll help. And, you know, we all learned sign language. My sister didn't speak till she was five. Um, um, I taught my sister sign language. I taught my sister to talk. I helped, you know, I helped her. She was my everything. And that's I, a beautiful thing, man. I knew she was my sister before she was born. And my parents mm-hmm. didn't do an amnio or any of that. Or mm-hmm. ultrasound. I would pray every night for my nightly prayers that Lord keep my baby sister safe <laughs> until she comes. And, um, you know, she and I still to this day have a, have a bond that is, you know, inescapable. She's the only reason I'm still here. Oh, and that's wow. kind of like one of the things God knew, you know, is that. that that relationship would keep the family together Yeah, through yeah. what we were about to go through. Yeah. So anyway, um, we're in Louisville, which funnily enough, happened to have the only, uh, it was a pilot program for Down syndrome children. Mm-hmm. And so that was a God thing, right? Absolutely. And dad's going to seminary and to uh, University of Kentucky for uh, master's work. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's working on his master's in divinity. And he had a double bachelor's in theology and biology from wow. Temple University. Yeah. So anyway, he, um, while he was going there, he ended up pastoring a couple of uh, smaller churches, and he got burnt out. They were, you know, kind of back up in the hills of Kentucky. There was a lot of, I guess, just underhanded stuff that happens in church leadership. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> leave We've it heard that. some stories. Yeah. Yeah. So I honestly don't know much about that situation because, yeah. like I say, I was only four or five at the time, five right. or six at the time. And so, anyway, dad gets burnout. So dad went into secular industry um and he worked at a like a carpet mill for a while and then he worked at a nuclear site because he had a biology degree and uh it's actually uh one of five sites where they put together the pieces of nuclear bombs oh wow tritium triggers for nuclear warheads and the plutonium fuel for the spaceship Hmm. it's a savannah river site um just south of aiken south carolina okay and um, so dad was working out there. He had to go through security clearance and all that stuff. Well, during that time, we were back around my grandma and on my mom's side and my grandfather on my mom's side. And um, my grandfather was the youngest, uh, the youngest 32nd degree Mason. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, and it, there was literally a newspaper article about it he would made 32nd degree at 19 years old how is that even possible exactly <laughs> and uh and he was a bush he was related to the bush family mm, okay so, um anyway uh i was being kept by my grandmother um from a my mom was working and my dad was working and um you know there was there were some things that happened that were rich ritual abuse Mm. um that had to do with masons and eastern star um you know a lot of it i don't remember i just uh how old were you at this point john this this was from the age of six about to turn seven until i was about nine or ten Okay. And uh, during that time, there was a lot of things that happened my parents didn't know about, but they started to see the the evidence of it or the, I guess, the change in me. Um, yeah. And this was just them caring for you while they were at work. And okay. Yeah. And I specifically remember like a falling out of like them saying she shouldn't have taken me somewhere. Um, and I don't know what all happen with that um i know that there's there's a lot of different things they do to you 
uh, with that. There's trainings you go through. There's things where, you know, different clips of movies will brainwash you to do stuff, uh, do certain things. And, you know, there's, I was trained with weapons. I was trained with like really strange stuff. Um, what's the idea behind it just to steer you down that same path? I mean, to kind of yeah. like accelerate your, yeah, it would, I would have been, yeah, I, I would have been a very, very high level Mason. Right. Um, I guess that's how you get to that level at 19. Somebody. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it's, um, and, and I did, I was never like official, um, I was never officially part of any lodges or anything, but mm-hmm. spiritually I operated as a high level Mason for a lot of my life. Wow. I didn't even realize it. Yeah. Cause um, it was like programmed, right? Yeah. It's programmed. It is partitioned. Your brain mm-hmm. is like partitioned. So you don't remember certain things will trigger you to do stuff. You don't even remember you did. Oh, wow. Um, you know, and one of the evidences of it, funnily enough, what came out, uh, is like firearms training, which is very strange for someone my, you know, from six to nine, it happened somewhere in there. Um, and I don't even know how they do it or if it's some spiritual thing or something, but I remember my grandfather could take an, like a Colt 1911 45 mm-hmm. and light matches with it 10 yards away. Get out he, of here. He put a match on a fence post and light it. Wow. And Yeah. And so there's there's a spiritual aspect of that. There's like a metaphysical thing going on. Mm. You know, it's not just um, because he wasn't even aiming. He was just pointing, you know, and I was crazy. I was like that, too, with pistols. I was always natural with it. And I thought it was because I played duck hunt a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Like growing up, I can tell you, I played that game. I didn't have that skill. Yeah, I thought I was I thought, oh, well, I guess, you know, that's what it was. But. No, it's not. It's it's something much deeper than that because yeah. later on in teenage years, just to fast forward a little bit on that, I was 17 years old. <clears throat> One of my best friends trained his whole life to be a spec op. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he he is today. I won't say his name because he, he made it into Delta and he doesn't exist anymore. Mm-hmm. I, checked, I, I checked the high school we went together. They don't have his transcripts anymore. It doesn't exist. So he went to the Air Force Academy. Then he went to um, Air Rescue, and he was like spec ops in the Air Force. Then he disappeared, and he had always wanted to be a Delta. So I imagine he he made it. Huh. But he and I were shooting together at seventeen years old. For me, as far as my personal memory, uh, it was the second time I'd ever shot a pistol. Right? Yeah. We're out there with Ricky French, who's the sharpshooter for the entire, the top shop sharpshooter for the entire North Carolina state prison system. Oh, wow. We're out there shooting with this guy, and he does like long range shooting and he trains all of the prison guards in firearms. Okay. So, my buddy who's been training all of his life, he's out there shooting a pistol <clears throat> and he's like giving him pointers. He's like, oh, hey, all right move your stance a little here, move your grip a little here, you know. All right, now now next time we can do this. And then he watches me shoot, and he just goes, oh, wow, you've been through a lot of training. <laughs> it was your second uh, time shooting? <laughs> it was my second time as far as I knew. <laughs> yeah, as far as he knew, yeah. Sharp shooter yeah. saying, you're good. <laughs> yeah. And my buddy over here who's, you know, done thousands of rounds with pistol. He's giving him pointers. Oh, wow. He just says, oh, yeah, you've been trained. Well, he's, he's like, you've done a lot of training. It's like, this is my second time. <laughs> wow. So, so what happened yeah, between 6 and 10 is kind of like just a little bit of a mystery, right? What? Like, yeah. I wanted to ask you, so your father is, you know, are, is his radar up on any of this? Like, is well, he see, questioning like too. what's He was out on. of the ministry at this time. He was kind yeah, of like mad at God about by... my sister being born with Down syndrome. And, you know, he's and then going through a really rough patch with a church up in Kentucky. They really, you know, mistreated him. And, 
you know, we're really, there's a lot of ugly stuff that goes on in the back, back rooms of churches. Yeah. And, politics and yeah. you know, uh, kickbacks on money the church spends through the deacon board and, mm. you know, stuff like that. There's a lot of ugly. So he was kind and, of jaded at that point. Yeah, basically. he's just, he was just, yeah. and plus he was going to seminary at one of the most liberal seminaries. Um, you know, there were professors there who, you know, questioned the virgin birth who said, you know, it was, uh, mm. let, it was from an affair with uh, Mary oh, had with a Roman centurion or something, you know, like, yeah, that high level intellectualism that just, yeah, the Pharisees, literal Pharisees and Sadducees of modern exactly. day. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, they, they crush the faith of ministers and then send them oh. out to the churches. It's really wow. sad. Yeah. It's terrible. So anyway, I get out of that situation and that's, you know, that's really all I want. I just want to leave that there. Yeah. I, I don't really, I, I put it like this. Later on, I had no memory. Of Later on, when I actually started doing like really hard psychedelic and psychotropic drugs in my late 30s, mm-hmm. memories came back. Is that right? Yeah. And I, I, and then there's certain things I will see now. Like I've seen someone, someone had posted what the inside of like a, ritual room of a masonic yeah. lodge looks like but they should post pictures of it with like the black and white tile floor and yeah. it's then be into an episode for like a day oh wow so i was ritual i was part of a lot of rituals in a place that had the black and white floor tiles wow and it is really dis- despicable and disgusting stuff and i you know no need to go into gory detail but it's well so i want to ask you something had, yeah well, I just want to ask you, like, because you were talking about, you know, kind of your early life and uh, your sister coming into the world. And, and prior to that time, you know, you're keeping her in your prayers every night. And so you you had a relationship with God established, especially with your father being in the ministry and, you know. Yeah, mom, mom was a Christian school faith. teacher. Yeah. <laughs> so when they kind of dip into, like, the secular world and he's kind of going through this, like, period of life where he's a bit jaded, like, are you kind of like have you dismissed god like throughout your teenage years and stuff well, see that's or? that's the funny thing about it is at seven years old when we first moved there mm. um we lived we we're renting a house that was right down the street from uh, a cemetery mm. and i would watch the funeral processions go by yeah and finally i asked dad when he got home from work one day i was like hey dad what happens after we die and I was seven years old. Dad took me down Romans Road. I got saved. Hmm. Uh, the church we were going to actually allowed him to baptize me. Wow. And, um, you know, it, I got saved at seven and, you know, baptized. And I sort of understood it, but sort of didn't, you know. Yeah. Um, and I still understood it as much as I could. And I was a very, you know, I was a very bright kid. I could read from the time I was three. I mean, I had parents who were teachers. Dad was teaching me math equations at like three, four years old. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it was constant. When your parents are teachers, they just teach, teach, teach. Right. And so, um, you know, but the the thing that I think really just tells the whole story uh, with what happened with my grandmother mm-hmm. was at, you know, about nine, ten years old, I finally told my parents, I said, I don't want to go to my grandma's house anymore. Mm. I want you to get me a babysitter. Yeah. And so what 10 year old do you know that would rather have a stranger watch them than their own grandmother? Yeah. Yeah. Something's wrong there. Yeah. And they knew, and and that, I think that was kind of a moment where they were like, Whoa, Hey, what, you know? Yeah. And they did, they listened to, they actually listened to me and they got me a babysitter and I was much happier. Yeah. After that, you know, and then dad goes through a revival. <laughs> okay. And uh, we went to see, um, I think we went to this big gospel concert. They got broken down. You know, he made a lot of money doing what he was doing at the nuclear flight, nuclear yeah. site. We got a nice two story house. We got all the things of the world that he had ever wanted. Yeah. You know, yep. we had nice cars. We took amazing vacations to the beach and, 
I really enjoyed that stuff. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Yeah, you know, as a kid, yeah, you know, yeah. I had the skateboard, I had the rollerblades, I had the basketball goal, I had, you know, yeah. I, was, I had the um, the Sonic Six Huffy bicycle, you know, with the six speed <laughs> shifter nice. that looked like a jet thruster. <laughs> yeah, and you know, jet pilot. I I was from the time I was a kid, I was obsessed with being a jet pilot. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Top Gun. And, uh, <laughs> oh, man, that was like one of my favorite movies as a kid. I used to watch that over and over and over Dude, again. me too. Me too. <laughs> I've tried to get my wife on board with that, too, because it's like I could watch it at any point. Like, and let me say, let me just go ahead and say this so there's no debate. Uh, Maverick is the best sequel movie ever. Ah, uh, nice. It's ever been made. I yeah, mean, they kid, they hit all the bases. They nailed it. Yeah, I haven't they hit all the bases. seen Maverick, and I feel like embarrassed oh my god that because i was such it. a huge top gun fan but um you got the yeah. best best sequel ever i gotta check it and out and just puts it to bed really nice. great nice so anyway i was obsessed with jets and uh i had a little book which i actually found not too long ago I'm not sure it's somewhere over there in my stack of books but i, I had a little book that i um memorized all of the stats of every fighter jet every you know every military aircraft oh wow and so they would when we moved back up to north carolina um dad decided to go back to school uh he decides to go to southeastern baptist theological seminary in wake forest Mm -hmm. and um so by the time we get up there i'm like 12 i was 12 when we first moved up there and um i took the seventh grade uh placement test mm-hmm. you know like uh achievement test whatever they call it and i scored uh pretty much junior year college to senior year college in yeah. every <laughs> subject except for my favorite subjects in which i scored graduate level at seventh grade that's nuts so the schools where we went back up all right so dad went from going like making 80 some thousand a year yeah. And making sixteen thousand a year. Yeah. <laughs> mom had mom had like a job and and making making some decent money at an optometrist office. She comes home to homeschool me and my sister because the schools at the place where we were at in North Carolina were really horrible. Mm-hmm. Nash County, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Were like cuttings and shootings in the junior high. So mom's like, Okay, I'll stay home with them and raise them. So we went from you know, probably out six figures of income to 16,000 oh, wow. a year. And yeah. I wasn't that big of a fan. Yeah. I'm just going to be real with you. I was a kid. <laughs> you were used to the creature I, comforts, man. Yeah. Like that yeah. <laughs> I know. I, I've become accustomed to a certain way of living. Yeah. And, <laughs> and we actually ate steak at one point. We ate steak so much. I got tired of steak. I was oh, like, wow. we have a steak again. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Anyway, but it, that's the truth of it. It's, you know, it's all like, it's not really the fulfillment, yeah. uh, worldly things. But anyway, uh, we, we get back up there. And so dad, mom's homeschooling me so I can work ahead and do, I make my own schedule of school. I'm working ahead on it's the easy. And so dad starts taking me to graduate level seminary class because he's like, you know, my son's going to be a minister. He's going to be a great minister. Yeah. And yeah. all this stuff. And it kind of backfired. <laughs> Triggered because, a little rebellion in you? Well, it's just, yeah, well, they, all right, I'll put it like this. I, by the time I was 15 years old, I had studied systematic theology uh, hermeneutics, ex- exegesis, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic. <laughs> uh, That's you know, awesome. And I had all of this knowledge. Yeah. But I didn't know him. Yeah. You know? And it was great. It was a lot of head knowledge. But I didn't know him. I wasn't you didn't have a relationship. relationship. Yeah. And I was having like suicidal thoughts. I was like, really? Yeah, because of all this stuff that happened, I was, I would like sit there with my dad's pistol in my mouth and just oh, want to wow. die like 13 so you years were, old. You were dealing with depression at a pretty early age. In dealing with it. Yeah. All that stuff was on me hard. 
Mm. And the only thing that stopped me from doing that was the thought of my sister finding me. Mm. That was the only thing that stopped me. Yeah. You know, because if it hadn't been for her, I'd, I'd be gone. Yeah. Because I didn't value myself at all. But I valued my sister. And she had Down syndrome. And I was like, who's going to look out for her? Because I was her big brother. Sure. You know? Yeah. And I was like, who's going to look out for her? Because I'm also her only sibling. So uh, it kept me here. It kept me here long enough, you know? Yeah. Well, at 15 years old, my dad uh, finished his degree, about 15, 16 years old. My dad finished his master's. It's 96 credit hour master's. It's like a law degree. And uh, he did it with languages, Greek and Hebrew. And, um, you know, it destroyed his faith, too. <laughs> Is that right? Really? Yeah. Like at a, because it was, there was a lot of cessationism taught mm-hmm. in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and just a lot of, like I say, head knowledge. Yeah. A lot of Pharisaical and Sadducee type stuff that doesn't bring you closer to God or, or build your faith. It just right. builds your head knowledge and it makes you question. They make you, they teach you all these things that make you question your faith. They question right. the scripture, right. which is the devil's first Absolutely. step. Absolutely, yeah. Is questioning the word of God. Yep. And they put all these doubts in your head about yeah. the scripture. And then they'll say, they. I've heard seminary professors say in their classes, sitting, I was sitting there, I had to take notes and everything. Yeah. My dad would, like my dad's, he's a hard dude. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can imagine a bad So, <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, you know, I was sitting there taking notes, 13 years old, you know, graduate class. And then my dad would review them after we got done. Is that and right? Show, show me his, show me how much <laughs> better his were than mine. <laughs> yeah. And say, do better next time. So, <laughs> perfectionism is a whole thing. Yeah. He's keeping anyway, you on the straight and narrow with that. <laughs> oh man. So anyway, but there were professors who would say, now, look, I'm going to tell you this, and I'm going to teach you this, but if you ever say this in the pulpit, you'll be fired the next week. Hmm. And then they would go through questioning the validity of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They would go through questioning the validity of the virgin birth. They would go through questioning the validity of the resurrection itself. Oh, wow. And... <laughs> you know, here I am. I'm a teenager in a situation where, you know, these guys are, these are old, you know, stuff coded men. And now there were some good ones too. One of my favorites was Carson the Wheel. Uh, he was a blind man mm-hmm. who, who taught there. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was a beautiful Christian man, a believer. And his assignments and papers and everything else of, of his class was designed to build your faith. Yeah, uh, he was he was he was the only one I just named. <laughs> mm. Yeah, there was guys like Gruesome and Grissom who like just tried to make your life a miserable hell, and uh, you know it was just I didn't understand it, and I, I still don't to this day. I, I I you know I get I get the the point of proper exegesis. I get the point of proper you know, hermeneutics. But I would just really, that's a fancy word for reading comprehension. Mm. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you're going to quote the Bible, don't quote Job's friends when they're talking to Job. Yeah. You know, like yeah. understand this, understand the context of Absolutely. the story. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like not that complicated. Um, But anyway, I've. So did your dad like, is, I mean, at the tail end of his education, was he just like, he like did this just burn out him out again? You know, it's like oh yeah, man, well, I tried this twice now, and you know. Well, check this out. Right on the end, he gets his master's degree. So then the church is like, oh well, he's going to go somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Well, at the same time, his dad had prostate cancer. He had had prostate cancer for fourteen years. My grandfather, who I loved, mm-hmm. uh, my grandfather, and my grandmother on on my uh, dad's side were beautiful, amazing people, and on yeah. my dad's side, the family four of the last five generations were ministers, you know, and my grandpa was a man of God. He went, he was a preacher's son who, who kind of rebelled till he was 39 actually. Mm -hmm. 
but he he was a man of God when I knew him, and he was a loving man and a, a wonderful grandfather. Yeah, and I had to watch him, cancer take him. Mm-hmm. You know, at four, I was fifteen years old. When that happened. Sure. Well, two weeks before he passed away, the deacon board called my dad, and they knew my grandfather was on his death. They knew hospice had been called for like two months. Yeah. They called him my father and fired him and gave him two weeks to get out of the parsonage that they made us move into uh-huh. because we, we already had a house before that, but they made us move into the parsonage. Now they're trying to kick us out three years later. Uh-huh. So, it's awful. you know, and they were, they were like even the constitution of the church said that we had two months. In terms of, they were trying to make it two weeks, which actually would have, put us moving out on the day my grandpa died like they were screaming in the meeting and stuff they had recorded the meeting they were screaming in the meeting like very demonic very demonic what were the what it, like what were the charges essentially um, for this they said he wouldn't marry someone because the person had been divorced you remember what i told you about my dad's story mm-hmm. <laughs> wow yeah. So, and the reality of the situation was these two people were, one of them was a nephew of a church member. They weren't members of the church themselves. My dad would refuse to marry anyone unless he put them through premarital counseling. Sure. Yeah. Um, he took them through pre- premarital counseling and advised them to not get married. <laughs> uh. Because the, the, the guy in the relationship who was the church member's nephew was still having a relationship with their previous ex-wife off and on. No good. Yeah. Physical. Like, yeah, there's obvious reason. And they were living together, living in sin. Right. And they want this blessing on their marriage. And he like took them through the cycle. It was a psychological approved model of. You know, he had a he part of his master's degree was marital counseling and premarital counseling mm-hmm. and marriage and family counseling. So, <laughs> and he advised them not to get married. So they said that was that. What it really was was he called them out on um, them uh, paying a deacon's brother's company twenty five thousand dollars for a project that should have cost five thousand and the deacon getting a kickback on it. Mm. Yeah. And he called him out. He called him out and he stood on the word of God on some, a couple of other things, a couple of other issues in the church. They got exposed. And so then they, they trumped up this thing about saying, Oh, he wouldn't marry them because they were, they had been divorced before. Mm. Well, no, if you're still sleeping with your ex, with your ex wife. Yeah. That's kind of a deal breaker. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah. Uh, so that was what they trumped up. And actually, active God wise, uh, that night, one of those deacons who was in that room, his uh, his chicken house burnt to the ground. Lightning strike. Wow. That'll yeah. tell you something. Yeah. <laughs> that'll, give you, that'll give you. There's there's other stories that are legend about something that happened back before I was born on a place called Shinkteag Island. But they, where they persecuted my parents and all hell broke loose on that island the year after they left. In fact, to this day, I can go up there and say, Hey, I'm John Story. And they're like, Come in, come in, stay in that, stay in my Is house. that right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was That's a wild like story. Every, everyone who uh, was part of this little conspiracy they had um, was either dead, affected by a huge tragedy, or uh, quadriplegic by the end of the year. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, but that's that's a testament to what my parents did, which was to forgive and leave. Yeah. You know, and I didn't see my parents walk as that as a kid for a long time. But what I saw was these people, these people mistreating us, mistreating my dad, and then having the gall after firing my dad two weeks before to show up at my grandfather's funeral. Mm hmm. The very people who did it. Yeah. And that was the first time I cussed out an adult. <laughs> the preacher said. And that was from that moment 
uh, that began my rebellion because I looked up at God and I said, God, if these are you, these are your people, I want nothing to do with you. Yeah. And that was it. So how, so you are how old at this point? You are uh, 15, like 15, 15, 15, about turned 16. All right. So let's get into this like rebellion season. What does this, what does this look like? Like at this point, uh, it's a preacher son rebellion. So, I mean, you know, it wasn't it was really that much. PG 13, you know? Yeah. 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 It was like, <laughs> Oh, I started smoking cigarettes, you know? Right. Right. Um, it wasn't really much until, um, you know, like I didn't, I didn't lose my virginity till I was like 18. And mm -hmm. then I got married to this, you know, the second one, second girl I ever slept with. And sure. But I, I had a lot of trauma. You know, I had a lot of stuff that I didn't know how to deal with. Yeah. And I turned my back on God. So I certainly wasn't looking to him. Yeah. So I looked to myself and I just really turned in on myself. I, you know, everywhere I went growing up, I was the preacher's son. So I was either a wuss or a bad boy, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so the boys always said, oh, you're a wuss. And they try and fight me. And then they find out I wasn't a wuss. And, you know, I went through that. I was never, I was never on the end, in the end crowd. Even when I played football and basketball in, in high school, yeah. I was only there my junior and senior year. Even at the Christian school, I was, I was an outsider at the Christian school for 10th grade year. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, where I got married young, I, um, divorced in my 26 years old. Uh, that was thanks in large part to my addiction to porn. Mm. Um, you know, I had lust issues from the time of a young age and deceit. The thing that really was the bad theme of my life was understanding from, from a preacher's son's perspective, it was all okay as long as I didn't get caught. Mm. Because getting caught or the or the the congregation finding out that I was doing something wrong, right? Or bad or sinful or whatever. Yeah. Uh the consequence of that was very rough. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You know, I went I went through, you know, my dad stepped down out of the pulpit and whooped my butt, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. I believe so, it. So and I earned all of them. I mean, I'm not <laughs> I'm not saying anything bad about him for doing that, but you're right. What it taught me was uh I was very intelligent and and so I figured out how to deceive. You were good at hiding stuff. Yeah. Very, very good. And I'd plan it. It was all premeditated, man. I had yeah. it all figured out how to get away with it and everything. Yeah. And most of the most of the time I did. And that concept along with the devil's lie that I wasn't worthy. Yeah. Um, I wasn't worthy of love. I wasn't worthy of anything. Um, and the fact I had this idea that to be a real man, you have to have an evil side. Mm, you gotta be the bad guy, the bad boy. Yeah. You gotta be the bad yeah. boy and you gotta, you gotta be able to just, you know, bring out that evil side. Well, my evil side was, was scary the most people mm. because it was rooted in like really messed up abuse. So, so it was very violent scared, kind of. Yeah. yeah. I did, well, it was crazy. It was yeah. crazy and demonic mm. and it, I put it like this. All right. So fast forward, I'm 26 years old. Um, my biggest, my big rebellion night, I was a lead singer of a band, a Southern rock band. I can and see me, that, man. You got the vocal oh, for yeah. that, yeah. Oh yeah, I would, I would do it up. We had a we had a great time. It was uh, four core members, and we went through six drummers in three years. But why is it? Uh, it's always hard to keep the drummer. I've always heard it. they're wild, man. They're wilder than me. <laughs> yeah. so, and that's wild. <laughs> that's saying something, huh? <laughs> but uh, yeah. So okay, so how we throw a Halloween party? We learn some Halloween songs. Yeah, and I come. Dressed as Anton LaVey. Oh, wow. All right. Well, priest outfit, six pentagrams on, eyeliner, black fingernails, uh, black And for those stick. who don't know, Anton LaVey and was the founder of the Church of Satan. Church of Satan. Yeah. Yeah. He wrote the Satanic Bible. Right. Yeah. So that was that was my preacher son rebellious moment yeah, of I'd my say life. That's, that's pretty high level rebellion. Though. Yeah, that's pretty high. 
that's, that's how far you go. So we get there. Um, and again, I never, I, you know, I smoked weed like once in high school, two or three times in college at Chapel Hill. And then after that, it really didn't, I was a drink, was a binge drink yeah. until I was 39. Right. Well, 36. 36, I started experimenting with edible marijuana. And then at 39, I went hard drugs all the way. I tried every hard drug in a week. Oh, wow. All right. Don't skip ahead yet. Yeah. I want to hear, yeah. I want to hear about yeah, this I'll, party. All right. So this is so, 26. So I come this. dressed as Anton LaVey. I drink, right. I drink a bunch of moonshine, real <laughs> North Carolina moonshine. That'll get you. I was up, I was up in the hills. <laughs> yeah. Up, north, right. of, north of the Piedmont. All right. Yeah. Some of that 190 proof stuff. Oh, man. And oh, so. be blind at the tail end of that. That's I know, right? <laughs> so I drink that. I'm drinking bourbon. My uh, wife at the time comes up to me and uh, in between after our first set and says, hey, you see that guy over there? I said, yeah. Uh, she said, he was hitting on me. And I said, she said, I pointed at you and said, that's my husband. And he looked at me and said, he, he doesn't care who my husband is. I said, oh, really? I said, well, let me go have a chat. Well, funnily enough, this guy, his name is John. He's another preacher's son. <laughs> And what no one told me, I didn't know this guy, what no one bothered to tell me about was that he was the three-year running bare knuckles until someone's knocked out Rockingham County Ironman champion. No. <laughs> no one told me. Oh, it's fine. No. So, but this is, this is the kind of evil I carried around, though, is you don't, I wasn't afraid of anyone. You weren't going to back down. I wasn't afraid yeah. of the devil himself. Yeah, they could have told so, you that and it probably wouldn't have stopped they you. They could have told me and I'd be like, oh, well. <laughs> yeah, not tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but it would have helped. I, yeah. yeah. So I walk up I walk up to this guy, dressed as Anton LaVey. I smack him, just, just open hand. Wow, wow, wow. Three times across the face. And I said, do I have your attention now? And he like glares up at me and he says, yep. I said, that's my wife over there. You say one more word to her tonight. I'm going to stomp a mud hole in your. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll censor myself. So he looks up. I said, are we clear? Do we have an understanding? He said, yep. I said, crystal clear. He said, yep. So I go back, I do two more sets. I'm drinking more. <laughs> yeah. So he comes up to me at the end of the night. Now keep in mind, I'm even deeper in the moonshine, uh -huh. deeper in the bourbon, yeah, deeper in the beer. I've had it all at this point. I can barely stand up. Right. He comes up, grabs my hand. I grab his. And I'm thinking, I've talked to my wife. He hadn't said nothing else to her. Okay, we're cool. Yeah. You heeded the warning. We're good. You know, man, you got nothing else to say to you. Right. And so he comes up and he, when I take his hand, he pulls me up to him and says, John, I know you're drunk. He said, but if you ever talk to me like that again or hit me like that again, I'll kill you. And I said, don't, I'd like threw his hand down. I said, don't tell me what you're going to do. If you're going to kill me, you better do it now. <laughs> <laughs> and I start talking all this crap. And I'm like, come on, hit me, hit me. I was too drunk to fight. But I was like, come on. I was going to mess with his head. I was going to destroy his self-esteem. Right. Right, there, right at that moment. And so I'm like, come on, come on, hit me. He started talking crap about his mama, like everything. And Don't so finally he gets, he, gets, he gets in the stance and he hits me with a right hook on my jaw. Solid, solid. My jaw hurt for a week. <laughs> <laughs> and I tilted my head back and I started laughing. And I laughed this big. <laughs> In your Anton LaVey costume, yeah. by the way. Which yeah. And then I was like, creepy. come here, boy. And just like lunged at it. And right about the time, like six people grabbed me and five people grabbed him and separated us. And. Wow. You know, but I saw the fear in his eyes when I laughed and looked him in the end and lunged at him. I saw it. He, I broke him, <laughs> you know, because he hit me good. Yeah. You know, I didn't care. 
I didn't care. Wow. I haven't, and what I didn't know was, you know, later on is stuff like that. I, I've been, I've been through stuff that most people can't even imagine and was basically trained to put all of it aside and continue on, you know, the mission. Mm. So, um, so yeah, that was, that was the kind of the height of my rebellion. Um, you know, I went on and lived a very hedonistic life, very successful as far as the world is concerned. Yeah. Cause you had a really successful sales career, right? Yeah. I, you know, I worked up in the electrical industry, um, into industrial. Then the, the recession, the great recession hit and went back to college, studied, uh, finance and accounting at East Carolina, which was mm-hmm. a party school. I went to at 30 mm-hmm. years old with a Harley. <laughs> yeah. They call they called me Dirty Thirty. That was my nickname. Dirty 30. Yeah, what that was the what sons all of the thunder, girls, man. <laughs> uh, yeah, not the son of thunder then. So <laughs> the girls would come out on the balcony when they heard my Harley come up to like the student living, yeah, uh, apartments, and they'd come out and scream Dirty Thirty. <laughs> and I looked up on the balcony above them was a bunch of guys, and they're just looking at me like. Psh. SOB. <laughs> like, they hated me. But, you know, I did that. I was a bartender there. I like created this whole image right. of who I was. You know, I was Dirty 30. I was John Story. You know, I was, you know, yeah. Mr. This, That, and the Other. And uh, then I got a job at Rockwell Automation. I worked my way up for seven years. I had a really cool job at Universal. Uh, studios for five years helping them oh, make cool. rides more reliable that's awesome yeah really cool stuff did did really cool engine electrical engineering type stuff uh yeah. consulting work uh then worked my way up into a dream job that most people in the company dreamed of having this job mm-hmm. i had the peninsula of florida as my territory <clears throat> i got paid to i got paid and expensed enough expense account enough to stay in beachfront hotels and travel around and wind and dine customers and, and our distributor. Mm-hmm. You know, I met Elon Musk. I met Jeff Bezos. Oh, really? Customers. Yeah. Yeah. They were my customers. They were That's them incredible. Out. You know, and we did, I worked for Rockwell Automation, Alan Bradley. I uh, was mm-hmm. some people, you know, most people don't know them because we don't, they didn't advertise. Um, but it was, you know, they make the stuff that makes stuff. Mm-hmm. So everything, anything in manufacturing, Rockwell Automation makes the stuff yeah. that controls everything. And then uh, those controls are also on all the rides at Universal and Disney and on the space shuttle. Rockwell International actually built the Saturn V capsule on the Saturn V rocket uh, that wow. went to the moon on the Apollo missions. Um, in fact, in Apollo 13, where they lock the engineers in a room mm-hmm. and they say, come out with a solution, those were Rockwell engineers. <laughs> So the company I used to work for, like Tesla would call our engineers in and pay like 21000 a week for seven engineers to be there and to help them solve a problem. Huh. Yeah. Cool. So it was a very high level company that I was working for. And I was the channel salesperson for a hundred million dollar a year sales territory, which happened to be the peninsula of Florida. Wow. And so, huge. yeah. And so I was, you know, clearing a lot of money. I got into partying. Now, was this and, like the partying? Did that come through kind of entertaining clients or was that more of like on the side of the business? It was, it was on the side, like the, the, with the clients, it was just, you know, having yeah, you know, expensive, and and, expensive scotch and yeah. nice steak. Right. Um, but yeah, I was also, you know, going to Miami a lot. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, if when you I want to find a good a party, cut, that's the place to go. <laughs> when, um, yeah, that, that crazy, crazy stuff, did crazy stuff, you know, um, yeah, that was where I got into, well, you know, harder drugs started with, you know, um, at 36, I started experimenting with, um, edible marijuana mm-hmm. and then it became legal here. So I got like a prescription and, um, but then at 39 to 40, something clicked in me, you know, it was like after COVID, you know, kind of like, yeah, it was after all the COVID stuff, 
because I got the I got the sales job right at COVID. Uh-huh. So it was about a year or two after after COVID first hit, um, and you know, I I just I got in with the wrong people. Mm-hmm. You know, I had a guy move in next to me who was like a meth user, and but he had been doing it for seventeen years. He was a sales guy, you know, and he seemed to have his stuff together, but then again, not. And <laughs> so he and I become a business partner. Mm-hmm. We started a real estate company together on the side, and um, yeah, and this is one of those cocaine fueled business meetings, right. and we we're like, oh, we're gonna make so much money. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and bad idea is the definitely something the devil sent to really, really be the be really final good. blow. Yeah, final blow. Like these later on, they were like, uh, I found out later that they had been trying to kill me for a while and couldn't figure out why I wouldn't die. <laughs> wow, like it was like a comedy of error kind of thing. Yeah, and... poisoning me. It's like put giving me. They, they knew I was allergic to aspirin, so they were, like, giving me aspirin in my drinks. Um, stuff like that. Yeah, just, like, crazy stuff. Poisoning my drugs, uh, which I was taking quite heavily, you know. And I was going on, like, eight, nine days, ten days without sleep, hard on meth. And all the other drugs, like Coke and, and everything else, I, I could just, like, pick up and put down for a weekend. But when I had meth, that was it. Is this the point when some of these like flashbacks are starting to like from that, that was from a, um, that was actually the the night I got arrested. The only night I've ever, only time I've ever been arrested. I was 18 beers in high on edible weed, um, ecstasy and mushrooms. Mm. Yeah. Cross buds. Yeah. So on all, you know, I I would I you know when you talk about going hard, I've gone hard. Yeah, you're probably lucky just and to I be had, alive at that point. I mean, yeah, I had the money to do it. You know, yeah, I didn't miss. I wasn't missing rent payments. And um, as actually the last night I drank, uh, was that night I got arrested. Wow. And um, yeah, that was the night when those memories came back. How um, old were you then? When when that that night I was. Let's see, that was. That was Easter of 2021. Okay. So that was April of 21. So I was about to turn 40. I was 39. So at that point, you started kind of seeing into the childhood stuff. Yeah. And that was before I'd done meth. I hadn't done any mm-hmm. meth at that point. I didn't do that till right after I turned 40, uh, so what, August of that year. What's the, uh, like, how do you pull yourself out of this before it kills you? Um, only God, <laughs> only God. And so I, I'm going down this really bad road with meth. I'm, I'm do using, I had a policy. I would only use it in Indiana. And so then I started traveling there more and more because we owned a, uh, okay. So that's where like the business partner is up in Indiana. Yeah. We owned a remodeling property. We we're remodeling it, rent it out up in Terre Haute, Indiana. Okay. And so I started going there more and more and, Right before New Year's of 2022, I met my wife. Oh, all right. And I didn't know she was my wife, and I was not seeing her as my wife at that point. Uh-huh. But God was like, go save this fool because he is mess. He's about to mess everything up. <laughs> wow. All right. So this is like New Year's 2022. Like, yeah, I met her on December 27th of 2021. Right Amazing turn, how God uses these women, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. I've, this seems to be a little bit of a recurring theme inside of, you know, some testimonies that I've heard recently. So I'll tell you it's what. It's real, man. man. Yeah, it is real. It's real. Um, we're probably at a point where we should break because uh, we're going to have to come back and do a part two, which uh, I can't wait. Uh, this <laughs> Absolutely. It's been an exciting Exciting part one, brother. Um, yeah, we got to get to the good part. We got to get to the good part we, of the testimony. <laughs> we do. I'm kind of, I'm on the edge of my seat here the whole way through this, but uh, I suspect that something good is on the other side of this woman um, <laughs> that oh, yeah. becomes your wife. 
So um, I can't wait to hear part two. Uh, I hope that you'll all come back to hear the second half of John Story's testimony. Um, This is, it's going to be a good one. I know this brother well, uh, you know, from getting to uh, sit with him in fellowship over the last several months. And I know the, the, the fire that burns inside of his soul for God. So there is a victory lap coming here, and I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> um, but we hope that you'll uh, come back and, and join us for part two soon. Thank you so much for joining us on the Disciple Podcast, and we'll be back soon. God bless. God bless. God bless.